The anointing of the Holy Ghost is sweeping through this house right now. The presence of the Lord has manifested itself to set free and to heal. Clap your hands unto the Lord and give him a big shout of praise in this house. Come on, I believe something supernatural is going to happen in this place. Hallelujah, this is the day the Lord has made. Are there any rejoicers in the house? Anybody thankful for the goodness of the Lord upon your situation? said amen god bless you you make your way back to your seat grab your bibles remain standing such an honor to be here i give honor to sister vesta mangan bishop and sister mickey pastor gentry and sister alexis thank you so much for the invitation all the staff all i've got many many friends in this room thank you so much for the confidence to be here today Got some family here, my brother and his wife, my two sisters, so glad that they are here in the house of the Lord today. I appreciate that so very much. <laughs> then Brother and Sister McGee is up here. The first man that ever let me preach was Brother McGee when I was 12 years old. And I appreciate that. And uh, they are like family to me. I give honor to my great church back home, the Pentecostals of Gainesville, which is just full of some of the best people you'll ever meet in your life. Brother Mangan, thank you so much for letting us be here. I actually came to try out for Messiah. A little fun fact here, when y'all looked for someone to play Jesus, it did my heart good to know that the person that's Jesus, his last name is Tony. Because if you want to find Jesus, start looking at the Tonys. Come on, somebody. And, uh, that is a true story. He is a second cousin of mine, and so... I'm in the, uh, if you need me, just call me. I'll be here. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end? Everybody say, the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end, everybody say the end, is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. In verse 3, we have the end. In verse 6, we have the end. In verse 8, we have the beginning. But notice in verse 6, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I want to grab those words out of that scripture, and that's what I want to preach to you for a few minutes today. The end is not yet. If you're going to help me preach, shout amen. amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. I think it is evident today that to say that we are living in the end times. Things are unfolding and happening at unprecedented pace. We used to wonder how some of the events of the end time could happen, but that thought has been eradicated because now it is abundantly clear how these things will happen. Now we're just waiting on when it will happen. There are wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, disasters, nation against nation, diseases, pestilences, or maybe you're more familiar with this word, pandemics, turmoil in other countries, unrest at home. More and more things are on the horizon that appear to be pointing towards something we know as the mark of the beast. Amazon is coming out with something called Amazon One. 
Let me read this to you. It is a contactless way for people to use their palm to make everyday activities like paying at the store, presenting a loyalty card, entering a location like a stadium, stadium or badging into work more effortlessly. The service is designed to be highly secure and uses a custom-built algorithm and hardware to create a person's unique palm signature, and you just have to wave your hand over a particular device. There's also some talk, and in some places, it's already the law that you can't go into certain stores or buy certain things or eat at certain restaurants unless you show a particular vaccination card. And one company is making a chip that you can put under your skin to make all of that more convenient. Now, before you quote me, hear me. I'm not saying that either of those are the mark of the beast. But both of them look a little beasty to me. <laughs> You can't help but read the newspaper and listen to the news and log on to the internet and not admit that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled just about every single day. I was given the high privilege and honor of speaking at Brother Irvin Baxter's funeral and he was the founder of End Time Ministry and a dear friend of mine with a vision to reach the world. I first met Brother Baxter over 20 years ago and his ministry called and wanting to come to Omaha for a prophecy conference. I didn't know anything about prophecy. I, I said this at his funeral. I said, all I heard was that he could get people in our church. And as a church planner with just about 15 or 20 people, that sounded good to me. I didn't know anything about the book of Revelation, but I knew that, that somewhere in there, there was a beast that had 10 heads and had a prostitute sitting on top of it. And that was intriguing to me because if that had been a movie, we couldn't watch it. And so I invited Mr. End Time to come and he, we began a great friendship and, and, and a desire to know more about the end time. And I was shocked when he died because, because I genuinely was under the impression that me and him were going to be the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. And now that he's gone, I'm left by myself and I'm having to look for a replacement. And so today I'm going to talk to Bishop Mangan to see if he's willing to stick around to the end of the tribulation and be one of the witnesses with me. But the book of Revelation declares that there is coming an antichrist. It declares that it will get to the point where people will be forced to take a mark, a name, or a number representing this beast. We know the Bible says it's the number of a man, 603 score and six. We're all familiar with that number, 666. Even people who do not go to church understands the negativity and the stigma behind that number. And we have tried our best to massage and manipulate that number to figure out who the Antichrist is. We have spent countless wasted hours trying to determine how someone can fulfill that number. We come up with equations like if you take the letter letters in someone's name and then multiply that by how many kids he has and then divide that by his wife's mother's cousin's aunt who had six dogs and six cats and fed them six times a day. Then carry the one and add a past participle to the left decimal of the hypothesis while at the same time deducing the fact that vowels have more value than consonants and hanging chads are still being talked about in Florida. And then understand that Trump is not the president anymore so therefore the last Trump has no doubt sounded. And then without any doubt, hesitation, or manipulation, I can confidently tell you that I don't have a clue how to properly apply 666 to the mark of the beast. But I do know that we are fastly approaching the end. I do know that Jesus is coming back. I do know that we're running out of time. But as long as we're still here, the end is not yet. Which means this is not a time to go hide in a bunker somewhere and store up some cans of pork and beans and twiddle our thumbs until Jesus comes and wonder how we're going to barely get by. The devil is alive. Somebody shout, not yet. 
This is not a time to wring our hands in worry and let the devil win with doubt and unbelief and fear. Now is the time for revival. Now is the appointed time. Now is the season that God wants to work in. Yes, we are in the end time, but it's not over yet. Yes, things are bad, but where sin abounds, the grace of God does much more abound. Yeah, we've had a couple of crazy years. But the book is still true. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I just wanted to stop by and encourage somebody. Don't you quit right now. Don't you throw in the towel. Grab that Bible study chart. Let's evangelize our community one more time. Let's have the greatest revival we've ever had. Jesus said the end is not yet, and as long as we're here, we might as well occupy until he comes. We might as well have revival until he comes. If you believe that, clap your hands and let's claim it that the end is not yet. We may be close, but we're still here right now. So God's got an opportunity to move. And so Jesus' disciples came to him in our text privately, wanting to know, hey, what's, what, what, what's the end going to be like? What's the inside scoop? Talk to us. Let us know so we can make ourselves ready. And, and, and he said in verse 3 that what's, what's going to be the end of the world? And Jesus began to give them things to look for. Let no man deceive you. Many are going to say they're Christ and they're going to deceive many. And there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And, and think, in other words, things are going to get bad. Things are going to get worse. But, but don't be troubled, he said, because the end is not Yet, nation is going to rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there's going to be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And, and, and I don't want this little end time text to scare you or freak you out because I really want to encourage you today. We, we, we've been conditioned to think that when bad things begin to happen to us, then it's the end. It's over. Hang it up. It's done. And for some of you, the enemy has whispered in your ear that because of this or since that happened, then you're at the end of your purpose. You're at the end of your calling. You're at the end of your usefulness. But Jesus said, hold on. This is the beginning. And the end is not yet. Somebody shout, not yet. Jesus was trying to reinforce the idea that just because bad things are happening doesn't mean that that's the end of it all. And so I want to take this same prophecy principle and I want to preach it to us as individuals and tell you that just because bad things are happening or has happened in your life doesn't mean you have reached the end. As a matter of fact, God can be using all of that to just give you a new beginning. Just because you're in the middle of a cycle of horrible choices, bad decisions, selfish desires, doesn't mean you have to stay that way. Just because you were born into a family that has more curses than cures, more problems than promises, more dysfunction than destiny, doesn't mean that has to be your end. Somebody shout, not yet. <laughs> I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I feel like I need to tell somebody God's not finished with you. God isn't done with you. You may be in a bad place, but this is not your end. Sin is not going to have the final word. The devil's not going to get the last laugh. The end is not yet. And there appears to be many examples of the Bible or in the Bible where it appeared to be over. But God said, not yet. There are many examples in this church where by all accounts, it was over. Absolutely over. But God smiled and said, not yet. There'll be droves of testimony filling these seats this week of ministers who thought their ministry was over, but God brought them to because of the times, and God's going to say, hold on one minute. 
Your end is not yet. I don't want to jump the gun here, but let me remind you about a man in Scripture. We don't know his name. We just know his issue. And that's still true today. We don't know a lot of people, but we know a lot of people's issues. <laughs> we'll just call him the demoniac. He had a legion of devils living in him. And to think his parents thought he would never amount to anything. He lived in the tombs. He was naked, constantly cutting himself. No one could tame him or control him. But yet, when he saw Jesus, even though he had all these issues, even though everybody had given up on him, even though everybody thought he had lost his mind, when he saw Jesus, he had this hope that maybe, maybe, Possibly, there was a not yet in his life. The devil kept telling him, look at your surroundings. Look where you are. Nobody wants to be around you. This is your end. But when Jesus showed up, all of a sudden he sensed, not yet. Not yet. And the Bible says that he ran and worshiped him. Now, before you just read that too fast, let's slow down for a minute. He ran, the man, the demoniac that had a legion that had 2,000 devils in him. 2,000 devils could not stop him. His issue didn't stop him from worshiping. His dysfunction did not stop him from worshiping. His lack of mental health did not stop him from worshiping God. And I don't want to mess with you too much, but he didn't run in the closet and put on any clothes first either. He just worshiped God exactly how he was. But he didn't stay that way. You got to quit judging people when they come in. Let them worship God exactly how they are. They're not going to stay that way. How many of you, when you came to church, you know good and well, God needed to do some stuff, but you begin to lift up your hands. You begin to magnify the Lord, and you didn't stay where he found you. Somebody shout yes. yes. And so if 2,000 demons could not stop him from worshiping God, let me just, I'm not at home, but let me gently ask, what's our excuse? When he began to embrace the attitude that I've been told ever since I've been in this situation that this was my end. This is how it was going to, this is where I was going to die. This is how it was going to be on my tombstone. Uh, that, you know, he, but he began to embrace that attitude that maybe, maybe there's hope on my shore. Maybe there's hope on my horizon. And, and all of a sudden he began to think maybe my end is not yet. And when he began to worship Jesus, his dysfunctions were dismissed. His problems were pardoned. His address was altered. And his worship allowed him to go home close and in his right mind I wish somebody shout it's not over yet don't you let that issue stop you from worshiping God today uh, if we can begin to worship don't you let the devil convince you well if I raise my hand I'm a hypocrite he's a liar don't listen to him just go ahead and worship God anyhow because if we could begin to worship him in spirit and in truth somebody could leave changed somebody could leave delivered somebody could leave full of the Holy Ghost somebody ought to clap their hands and worship God right now Now look, we're, we're Pentecostals. I get that. We're Pentecostals. We put a premium on lifestyle. We put a premium on discipleship and dedication to the Lord. I get that. But, but sometimes we mess, we mess up a little bit too. And we try to act like we got to be perfect before we can offer praise, prayer, or purpose to God. The Bible does not teach us that we have to. No, this is going to. The Bible does not teach us that we have to be Pentecostal to praise Him. It doesn't even teach us that we have to be good to praise Him because there's none good, no, not one. It doesn't even say we have to have it all together to praise Him. All it says is, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise. Worship can still fix a lot of stuff. Let me say it again. Worship can still fix a lot of stuff. 
If he didn't let 2,000 devils stop him, then quit letting little things stop you from worshiping God. Somebody's going to get a breakthrough today. Somebody walked to church with no hope and you felt like this was the end, but God sent a preacher here to tell you, not yet. Yes, it may be bad, but this is not your end. Lazarus was dead. Let's go a little deeper here. Lazarus is dead. I don't mean for 15 minutes. He, he's, he's dead. He's buried. He's been in the grave for four days. His body is already decomposing. The Bible says by now he stinketh. Now, I don't know what your definition of the end is. But that's got to be close. But then Jesus showed up. He's wrapped in grave clothes. He's buried. The tomb is sealed. The stone is in place. But Jesus showed up and somebody testified and said, hold on, not yet. Surely I got to be preaching to some people who feel like you have buried some things prematurely. You've, you're, you're, you're battling a little bitterness because God didn't show up on time like you thought he should have. And you're battling bitterness because of all of this and it looks like it's over and your dream is buried and your promise is buried and that situation is beyond help. But God sent me here to tell you, not yet, not yet. Not yet. Where have you laid him? Remove the stone. Take off those grave clothes. God isn't finished yet. This thing isn't over yet. The end is now. Who am I preaching to? There's got to be some people who feel like you're at the end. You feel like it's just all pushed aside. But I want a spirit of not yet to enter into this sanctuary and baptize us with a fresh revelation. There is hope, there is healing, and there is help walking down your road. Not yet, devil. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Somebody ought to shout, not yet. Not yet. I know it looks bad, but he's the author and the finisher. I know you don't see any other way out, but he's still a way maker. I know what folks are saying, but let God be true and let every man be a liar. I know you may have taken a nasty fall, but rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. Just because I'm down, that's not where I'm going to be buried. I've got a not yet in my spirit. God's not finished with me. God's not finished with you. God's not finished with his church. Not yet. The end is not yet. God's not finished with you. God hasn't written you off. Not yet. As long as you're breathing, there's a place for repentance. Not yet. Speaking of nasty falls, let's go even a little deeper. Acts chapter 20, verse 9. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, you got to watch them long-winded preachers. <laughs> he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, trouble not yourselves. His life is still in him. You know why he was called Eutychus? Because Eutychus too, if you'd have fell out the window. <laughs> I'm not even going to look over here right now. I'm just going to kind of look over on this side of the church. <laughs> but now I don't know what they're doing, but you know that's funny right there. That's funny stuff. That 
That'd be the only thing y'all remember all day. Oh, yeah, that was that preacher that said. <laughs> Eutychus fell out of the window. Listen to this. But before he fell out, the Bible says he fell in to a deep sleep. Long before you fall out of the church, you'll fall in to other things. And Eutychus fell out of the window. He looked dead. They were ready to call the coroner. Get the funeral home on the line. See what kind of life insurance we had. See if the church has got insurance. <laughs> Call the family in. But Paul said, hold on. I know it looks like the end. But not yet for him. There's still life. That fall should have killed him, but not yet. That situation should have buried him, but not yet. That iniquity should have been his demise, but not yet. For everybody in this room that has ever suffered a fall and it looked like it was over, I wish you would shout, not yet. Maybe your kids have fallen away and it looks like they'll never come back. I wish some mom and dad would shout, there's still life in them. There's still life in your ministry. There's still life in your family. And we're going to anoint this place today because there are families coming from all over and they need to know there's still life in their city. There's still life in their church. There's still life. They're coming thinking it's the end, but I've come to tell them not yet. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. Let's stand all over this place. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Now, the Lord is coming. He just hasn't come yet. This thing is going to end. It just hasn't ended yet. It may get worse before it gets better, but it's just, understand, even in your own life, things may get worse, but as long as you're breathing, you've got opportunity for God to do a redemptive work of hope and healing in your life. The end is not yet. Just remain standing. I'm going to close. But Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30 says, I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. I love this last part. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. I want to tell somebody that sin you're in, it doesn't have to be your end. It doesn't have to be your ruin. It doesn't have to be what defines you. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel chapter 18, the whole chapter, and I planned on preaching on a little more, but, but the Lord's here, so we don't have to do all that. It takes away anything. That, in Ezekiel 18, they're blaming the previous generation for their issues. And, and Ezekiel's trying to tell them, no, you've got to take personal responsibility for your own actions. The Bible teaches us that in Ezekiel chapter 18, that this, in verse 5, there was a man that lived right. He received the blessings of the Lord in chapter 10. Or excuse me, in verse 10, he had a son and that son didn't live right. And he received the cursings. And then that son, in verse 14, had a son. So you got a father and a son and a grandson. The father did what was right. The son did not do what was right. But the grandson said, I'm not going to let my father's iniquity be the end of my life. Salvation is multi-generational. It is unto you and to your children, but it is not hereditary. You get the color of your eyes, the shape of your ears, the size of your nose from your parents, but salvation 
is not passed on. You have to get that for yourself. And all that teaches me is that I can break that generational curse. I can break that addiction. I can break that stronghold. I want to preach to somebody in Alexandria today, and you may not be perfect, and you may not come from perfect backgrounds, and you may still struggle with something from time to time, but you hear this preacher, God still loves you, and God can use you, and God can bless you, and don't you let any ancestor from your past put a curse on you that keeps you down. It's time to lay aside every guilt and understand there is therefore now no condemnation. You don't have to fight your daddy's demon another day. Man, it just, it just looks like this is the end. It just looks like this is the end. It just looks like this is how it's going to end for me. No, 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 no. That iniquity, that sin, that trap is not going to be your ruin. If you look up that word ruin in the Hebrew, it just means a stumbling block. That's not what's going to keep you down. Jesus said... You know, when all these bad things starts happening prophetically, the end is not yet. So let's apply that to our lives. When the devil starts attacking you personally and he tries to convince you this is it. I might as well not even go to church. I might as well not even repent. I just want to remind you the words of Jesus. Not yet. God's not finished with you yet. Slip your hands up all over this place. You don't have to let that generation curse hold you. You don't have to let that addiction have power on you. I wonder if there's somebody that just feels like the enemy's been telling you this is your end. This is how it's going to end for you. This is the bad. This is is the bad, the ugly. You know, this is not going to get any better. And you've been starting to believe some of that. I know we're going to anoint this place in a minute for because of the times, but it it would just be a shame not to give somebody a chance to embrace the words that the Lord's trying to tell us today that your end is not yet. Your end is not yet. God's not finished with you yet. I wonder if there's somebody that could overcome a little bit of guilt and condemnation. I wonder if there's somebody that forget about what anybody else may think about you and go, this is not how it's going to end for me. This iniquity will not be my ruin. This is not how it's going to die. This is not how I'm going to leave. This is not how it's going to get a hold of me. There's something, God's not finished with me yet. I want you to embrace that. God's not finished with you yet. If you take a few minutes and just begin to worship Him. Take a few minutes and just begin to praise Him. Let Him walk by your pew. I know the doctor said that's going to kill you, but the Lord's saying not yet. Not yet. I know the doctor said there's no hope, but the Lord is saying not yet. Not yet. Come on, we're just going to pray a little bit right here. We're going to pray a little bit right here.